Welcome to Masters and Creators from Frames to Names, the show where we look at some of the most influential creators in history and how their influence impacts the way we tell stories to this day. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the master of mysticism and revitalization in comic books, Grant Morrison. I'll be honest with all of you, I'm so excited to be doing this episode because I'm a huge fan of Grant Morrison. He's known for reviving characters such as Animal Man, the Doom Patrol, and the X-Men, and he breathed life into Superman through his book, All-Star Superman. Grant Morrison is super unique in the world of writing. He has inverted what it means to be meta. He is an outspoken chaos magician. He's had alien abductions that he speaks about. He is insane and I love every second of it and we're gonna get into talking about him now. So Grant Morrison was born in Glasgow and from what I could tell he had a pretty good home life. I couldn't find much information on his mother but his father was an ex-soldier turned pacifist turned anti-nuclear war activist. His father would do things like take his son out with him, kick a ball over a fence of a nuclear weapons base so the two could climb over, act like they're searching for the ball so if security came up they had an excuse for being in there, when really what his father was doing was taking pictures of the nuclear weapons. Because of this, Grant saw some very shocking things from a very young age and he became very politically aware and the looming threat of a bomb was very real for him. To escape this fear, he found himself lost in superhero comics. Later in his life, he'd come up with the concept that before the bomb was a bomb, it was an idea. So instead of putting your energy into ideas like that, put your energy into ideas like superheroes, because that's a better idea at the end of the day. For secondary school, he went to an all boys school, which when he was 11, he thought was a great idea. And then as he got to about 12, he thought this was a terrible idea because he just wanted to meet girls, but he had no way of leaving this all boys school. So he was just stuck there. When it came time for him to go to college, he actually applied to an art school and he got rejected. So he didn't know what it was going to do of his life until eventually he found himself touring with his band The Mixers. Throughout all of his teenage years though, he would dabble in comic books, mostly drawing comics and writing his own comics. But he wouldn't do much professionally until eventually he started working for 2000 AD. By this point, The Mixers had dissolved. At 2000 AD, he would create Zenith. Zenith was this Generation X hero that was originally created to criticize the conservative party and their lack of empathy towards younger generations. This was 1987 and it's still relevant. How crazy is that? <laughs> Zenith was a total hit and it put Grant Morrison on the top of the shortlist for DC's British Invasion. So following the success of Alan Moore's Watchmen and Swamp Thing, DC was like, British writers clearly know where it's at so we're just gonna hire a bunch of them and included in this group was Neil Gaiman and Grant Morrison. While Neil Gaiman went on to make Sandman, Grant Morrison chose to revive a little known character at DC called Animal Man. And he chose this character because not many people knew about Animal Man, so he could just be as weird and as wild as he wanted. Well, at first he started out by copying Alan Moore's style because that's what DC wanted. He just began to push his own style into it. And his style is very much you embrace that a comic book is a comic book. It's a world where the sky is always blue and the grass is always green and you can go 10 years into the future just by flipping a page. This continued until eventually he appeared in the comic himself as a character and sort of said to Animal Man, look, I'm sorry your family's dead, but we have to sell comics. And Animal Man's like, well, that's not very fair. Can you bring them back? And Grant Morrison's like, yeah. I can because it's a comic and he just brings his family back and he gets it. He gets that you can do anything in comics and that's what makes this medium amazing. Because he did so well with Animal Man, DC trusted him with one of their heavy hitters, Batman. He would go on to create Arkham Asylum and Karen Berger, Grant Morrison's direct contact at DC, actually called Morrison up to tell him his sales figures and instead of telling him a number, she just went, you're rich. You see, Grant Morrison was getting one dollar per issue sold at this point. The comic sold over a hundred thousand issues in its first weekend. He used this money to go out and travel, see new things, meet new people, and just experience the weirder and wilder side of life. And he put all of these experiences into his next comic, The Doom Patrol. So The Doom Patrol is a Silver Age of Comics team that are widely considered 
the world's strangest heroes, but at this point they're oftentimes considered DC's attempt at the X-Men, even though they came out at the same time as the X-Men, but it's whatever. But Grant looks at this team and goes, oh, you want freaks? I will give you freaks. And he creates characters that have powers no one should ever want, like no one. You had characters like Crazy Jane that has 68 personalities trapped in one body, and each one of the personalities either has a different condition or a different power. It's like one of the personalities just has a sun for a head. You have the negative spirit, which merged a man and a woman together into one body using alchemy. You have a girl that's part monkey. You have a brain in a tin can. You have everything like that. The comic uses aspects of Dadaism, is a complete surrealist take on comic books themselves. It's insane to read, it's a trip, and it's great. Then in 1993, DC's Vertigo imprint was launched, and Grant Morrison would actually write a Doom Patrol spin off called Flex Mentalo Man of Muscle Mystery. Flex Mentello is really hard to explain, but it's one of the best comics in creation, in my opinion. It's a surrealist comic, and it follows the concept of if comic books are our ideas manifested onto paper, our concepts, that means we could follow these ideas instead of having negative ideas like bombs. The whole comic has the theme of choosing love over fear, and it also takes into account the aspects of chaos magic that Grant Morrison uses. But most of all, this comic really pushes what it means to be meta. It sort of inverses the idea of what being meta is, which sounds weird, it's impossible to explain because this comic is an experience. Experience. If you really want to push yourself, I definitely say read Flex Mentalo. Following this, he did JLA, which merges DC's top seven heroes into one team. At this point, the Justice League was like dead, like no one cared. So if Grant Morrison didn't write this run, probably the Justice League would be a concept of the past at this point. Towards the end of the 90s, Grant Morrison would begin working on the Invisibles. The whole comic has this underlying tension that society was going through as it approached the new millennium. It focused on both pop and subcultures, and Morrison even said that he went through this experience while in Kathmandu, where he believes that aliens may have abducted him. This comic was his way of spreading the information that the aliens gave him. He has since out there that he wasn't actually abducted by aliens, he just sort of had this vision while in Kathmandu, and he could only describe it as an alien abduction, but it wasn't actually an alien abduction. Fun fact, everyone that's ever read The Invisibles sort of thinks The Matrix stole from The Invisibles, like a lot. Once The Invisibles was done, he'd have another stint at Marvel, and here he would create one of my favourite Marvel characters of all time, Novar. Novar goes by the name Marvel Boy, and this is a comic that merges the visuals of fetishism with superhero and action movie tropes, it's a wild ride. And you hear fetishism and you think, oh, it's going to be a sex comic. No, there's there's nothing sexy about it. But when I say it merges fetishism, you've got like characters wearing latex costumes. One of them has mind control spit. The other one has poison nails and she's in a dominatrix costume. But there's nothing sexy or sexual about it and it's great. But his most important comic at Marvel was his run on the X-Men, another comic he was able to breathe life into. His run on the X-Men is one of the best runs of the X-Men you could ever read, and for his run it was retitled The New X-Men. While he was writing it, it was the best-selling comic in the world. In this run you had things like Emma Frost and Cyclops having an affair, but since Emma Frost was a psychic, she could keep the affair a secret by having it all take place in Cyclops' mind, because where better to hide than in your own mind? Thing is, Cyclops was dating Jean Grey, another psychic, and she was part of the Phoenix Force at this point, so she knew something was up. So she went into Cyclops' mind and saw him sleeping with Emma Frost. It was amazing. It really pushed the boundaries of, huh, these mutants could have these weird and wild abilities, and I recommend it. He would return to DC and make The Filth, which was a follow-up to The Invisibles in terms of style. Again, it was a surrealist book and it dealt with a number of the same themes as The Invisibles, but this time it had the underlying theme of immersion and redemption from negative habits and influences. Then following this, it's just a bunch of superhero romps. My favourite one is the Seven Soldiers series, which contains about 30 issues, but the best part of it, in my opinion, is Seven Soldiers Clarion. It follows an old character from DC known as Clarion the Witch Boy but it really sort of changes what this character could be. Instead of just having him be this antagonist, it sort of changes him into a curious hero. Then in 2005, he would breathe life into the longtime unpopular character by this point, Superman. The issue with Superman is a lot of writers write him as a high stakes action character and Grant Morrison was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And he wrote him 
as this friendly sun god that just wants to look after everyone. But he also had Superman discover himself and it was a really like emotional comic that I can't recommend enough. I always say if you want to get to know who Superman really is, not what people think he is, read All-Star Superman because this is Superman not anything else. Then in 2006, he would begin a seven year run on Batman comics. And the first thing he did was introduce Damian Wayne back into the fold. This led to Grant Morrison writing Final Crisis, which saw the death of Batman, which in turn led into the world's first ever Batman and Robin comic. Now Batman and Robin had been in comics together since the 40s. This comic was very unique in that it was Dick Grayson, the first Robin as Batman, and Damian Wayne, the son of Batman, now dealing with his father's death as the fifth Robin. For the first time ever, Batman had to hold back Robin. Batman had to stop Robin from killing, and it had always been the other way around. If you want to get into Batman comics, I always say start with this run because it's honestly so good and so unique, and it's not even that long. Following this though, it's just a lot more Batman stories. He stayed on Batman until the New 52, which point he very much became tired. DC sort of had a very strong editorial hold during the New 52, so I can understand why he didn't want to stay on for much longer. He would do action comics, but this wasn't well received. He would do multiverse T, which I love multiverse T, but it's a comic for DC fans. And it's weird because if you're a DC fan, chances are you already know about multiverse T, so I don't need to tell you about it. But it's basically a comic that maps out DC's multiverse. And to understand it, you kind of need to knowledge of DC. The best one is multiverse T Thunderworld, which is a unique take at Captain Marvel. I can't recommend this to people that want to get into Grant Morrison. But if you have a knowledge of DC and you somehow didn't know about multiversity, check it out. Currently, he's writing for the sci-fi series Happy, which is based on his own comic. And it's rare for a comic writer to be able to screenwrite for their own series. So I am here for it. If you want to learn more about Grant Morrison, there's actually a documentary on YouTube called Grant Morrison Talking With Gods. I totally recommend it. It gets into his whole chaos magic side, gets into his personal life. And Grant Morrison's actually quite a secretive person, so it's hard to get to know his personal life. but. In this, he's quite open and it's really nice to see that. I love Grant Morrison's work. His work has been a part of my life since I was two years old. So he's basically influenced the way I see the world and I can't thank him enough for that. Like, honestly, I just love his work so much. One of the things I do is work as a showrunner and he's definitely influenced how I function as a showrunner and how I write my shows as a screenwriter. So I can't recommend him enough because I just love what he does. He's influenced me more than any other writer. Close second is probably Neil Gaiman, Master of Life, Death and Destiny. And we're gonna be talking about him next week, right here on Masters and Creators from Frames to Names.